All right, now we're going to talk about how to put your quotes into your writing. So how to use textual evidence. First of all, you need to remember, like I've said a million times, a quote cannot stand on its own. You can't just drop a quote into anything. You have to surround them by what they need. So as this slide points out, you need to sandwich them. Quotes are orphans that have been taken out of their original context surrounding. They need to be integrated, embedded, and sandwiched into their new surrounding, which is your writing, with an explanation, introduction, or reason for why it's being included. They don't speak for themselves, so if you don't put something around them, then it's like a piece of meat just sitting on the counter. You need to put something all the way around it. Your quotations are going to be part of a complete sentence when you're done with this. So let's get started. Here's how to do the in-text citation for Macbeth, or for any play for that matter. First you put the line or your quote in quotation marks, and then you use the at, the period, scene, period, and lines. So the example we have here is fair is foul and foul is fair. This is in Act 1, Scene 1, Line 13. Notice the period goes on the outside. Do not use page numbers in your parenthetical citation when you're talking about a play, okay? We're just going to be using Roman numerals for the act, Roman numerals for the scene, and traditional numbers for the line. Now, when you get to college and you have to do this, your professor may tell you that you can use just traditional numbers, but for now, it's we are going to be using Roman numerals. This is something that's optional, but we are teaching Roman numerals. So for your work cited, it needs to be exactly like this. The author's name, their first last name, then first name, the title of the play in italics, the city of publication of the, the format that you're using, the publisher, the year of publication, a period, and then the medium of publication. Always italicize the title of your play, Macbeth, in italics for the play, but when you're talking about the character Macbeth, you're just going to do it in regular type. Your work cited should be double spaced, the second line should be indented, and definitely check the punctuation on this slide so that you have all the punctuation correct. You need the periods in the right place, and the commas and the colon. Notice that there's a colon after the city of publication. All right, so now we are here on in-text citations. This is what it's going to look like inside your writing when you have short quotes, okay? So if the quotation's on one line, then you put quotation marks around it within your text. Notice that there's no punctuation after the last line of the quotation. The only time the punctuation is included, included there is if it's an exclamation point or a question mark. So in our first example, the lords at the table begin to question Macbeth's sanity, which is obvious when Ross suggests, comma, and then here's what Ross suggests, gentlemen, rise, his highness is not well. Notice there's no period after well. Instead, the period goes at the end of your citation. However, if we look at the other example, we have the reader sees Macduff's loyalty to the throne and his first reaction after seeing Duncan's body, dead body, is to wake everyone in the castle by shouting, comma, murder and treason. Now, since there was an exclamation point in the original text, we put that on the inside of our quotation marks. We have our citation afterwards and our period at the end. You do it the same way if there's a question mark. So notice the difference between these two examples of in-text citations for short quotes. Now, if the quotation is two or three lines, you're still going to include the quotation within your text, but you're going to use the forward slash to indicate the separate verses. So in the original text, when it goes from one line to the next, you're just going to put these slashes in place but the citation works the same way. Now, if you're going to be doing some dialogue where it's between two or more characters, you have to do it a certain way. Look over at the example while I go over these um, specifics. 
First, no quotation marks are used, so you're not going to do any quotation marks. You're going to start the quote with the character's name who said it. You're going to write the character name in all capitals and follow the name with a period. You're going to indent the entire quote a half inch from the left margin. After the first line, you're going to indent each line by using tab, which does not include a character's name. At the citation end, with the period after the close of parentheses. So if you look at this, the, quote, the citation is the same as our shorter quotations. You just put it at the end of the dialogue. But notice how the spacing changes. So we have Macbeth and Banquo are surprised by the prophecies of witches provide, comma. And then we have Macbeth says, your children shall be kings. Banquo says, you shall be king. Macbeth says, and Thane of Cawdor too. Went it not so? Question mark. Because it's a question mark, you do include that punctuation. You have your citation and the period at the end. And then this text continues. However, their conversation is interrupted by an arriving messenger. So always providing the context to your quote is really important, just like these examples do. Now, when your quotations are four lines or more, then you have to format it using a block quotation. The same rules go as they do for dialogue. Note that there is a colon after the lead in to the quote and, and the period goes after the citation. So when we're using a block quote, instead of on a last one when we had the dialogue that was just three lines long, we used a comma. This time it's more than four lines long, so we're going to use a colon. A second apparition of a bloody child appears and says, colon, and then we have the same rules that applied in our last slide. We have the, the person who's saying it with a period and their text that they say. We go all the way to the end of this and put the citation at the end or the period at the end. Notice that the context has been provided for this. There's something before it and something after it, that sandwiching idea that we had at the very beginning. Now, if you have to add or omit words from your text, there are certain things you need to do. So look at these two examples. If you add a word or words in a quotation, you should put brackets around the words to indicate that they are not part of the original text. You only do this for clarification for the reader because they would not have the entire quote in context. So for example, Macbeth returns from murdering Duncan and tells Lady, Macbeth, Lady Macbeth that they did wake each other. And since this is out of context, we need to indicate who they are so that the reader knows. So Malcolm and Donald Bain is who, she, who he is talking about when he says that. So that's why Malcolm and Donald Bain are put in those brackets to let us know who they is. And if you omit a word, then you're going to indicate the deleted words by using ellipses, which is just those three periods. And you have a space before it and after it. The Lady Macbeth speaks to herself and says, I laid their daggers ready. Had he not resembled my father as he slept, I had done it. Notice the citation is there, the period's at the end. Since Lady Macbeth's line went on several different lines in the original text, we have the slashes, the forward slash, indicating the separation. So when you are adding words to a quotation, you put brackets. If you're omitting words, you use the ellipses. Here's some additional examples for you to kind of look at. You work your quotation into your sentence and you provide the citation. Notice that there's no comma before the quotation when it fits in as part of your sentence. Um, but you do continue to keep the capitalization the same as it is in the original text. So Lady Macbeth offers the readers a glimpse at her morality when she tells Macbeth she would have killed Duncan herself had he not resembled her father. Um, we didn't put a comma there because we just worked it into our text. So it's a little bit different here. But the period still goes at the end. You can see that the her is in brackets because that is not in the text itself. 
but we need to clarify that for the reader of this paper. Second example says, however, Macbeth is not the only character who mentions daggers. Donalbane provides the symbol as a reference to the theme seed of appearance versus reality when he describes the daggers and men's smiles after Duncan is killed. Notice the citation here, the period at the end. We didn't use a comma here because this worked and flowed into our sentence as if we were writing it ourselves. So no comma was necessary then. Always lead in or introduce your quotation and then provide it. So notice the comma before the quotation. Also, there's no punctuation after the last line unless it's a question mark or an exclamation point. So, enraged at her husband's weakness, Lady Macbeth tells Macbeth, comma, now we're saying this is what she's saying, screw your courage to the sticking place and will not fail. Notice the forward slash because and will not fail is on a separate line. We have line, um, act scene lines with the period at the end. The second example includes a question mark. So notice that it's on the inside and there's still the period on the outside. Lady Macbeth pulls her husband aside and asks, are you a man? Question mark. And then we have the citation with the period at the end. And finally, Macbeth's increased confidence is further illustrated when he demands of the witches, I conjure you by that which you profess. However you come to know it, answer me. And there is a period at the end of this quotation. Things to keep in mind. After you make sure that your MLA format is perfect, here are things that you need to do. Use present tense. Go back through. Make sure that you are using present tense in your writing. The play is always happening, so we're not using past tense. Do not use any personal pronouns. I, we, us, you. Get rid of these. You can do control F and see if they're in your text. Now, if it's part of your direct quote, you can use it, but otherwise, no. Don't use contractions. Can't, don't, wouldn't. Spell these words out. Again, unless they are in your quotation. Do use apostrophes for possession. So if it belongs to someone, it's apostrophe S. Macbeth's heart and soul is our example here. Do use advanced vocabulary. Try to change some of your words up. Use the thesaurus. See if you can find some synonyms for the words that you're using. Um, do use trigger words and transition words and do not use RIP words. We have a list of those coming up. So here are some advanced vocabulary. So instead of always saying, um, Macbeth said, Macbeth said, you can say Macbeth claims, Macbeth compares, defines, observes, justifies. Look at this list. You have access to this PowerPoint anytime, so make sure you check it out. We're also going to make sure that we don't use any RIP words, so here they are. Get rid of these things. This is, that is, these are, it, was, really, totally, literally. I'm going to go ahead and add gonna to this list because people are using the word gonna. It's not even a word, okay? Um, try to avoid these. Pull this list out when you're done and see if you can go in and change some things up, okay? And that is all I have.